how did we get here? This is a long and many layered story. The details have been hidden for many long years of silence and indifference. We, in our efforts to correct the system of colonization, are only now uncovering the truth and turning pages of records that reveal the names and faces of the Native American children who were taken from their families to boarding schools designed to remake them into our image of Americans. The government and the churches worked together to build and run the schools in order to kill the Indian to save the man. The plan was in some ways a failure because the Native Americans were resilient, able to adapt and survive despite the efforts to kill the Indian in them. The painful separation from their families caused generational trauma that continues to impact Native American communities today. In spite of the labor intensive education and rigid discipline, the Native students were able to salvage slivers of their culture to pass on to the future generations. We will hear in this presentation, both the tragedy and triumph as we examine several layers of this story. Let us not only listen to the stories, but also learn from them and then take action. As we join in our litany prayer, we'll be taking moments of silence and responding. So feel free to unmute for the responses. We quiet our hearts and remember children. The confusion of being removed from their home, from the bird song that spoke in the morning, from the familiar scent of sweet grass. What was their prayer? What was their cry? We remember their prayer. We remember their cry. And we listen with ear and heart for the cries of other children so we might respond differently. <laughs> We quiet our hearts and remember children. The shame of being stripped of their clothes, the cutting of their hair, having their heart language forbidden to be heard. On the wind, what was their prayer? What was their plea? We remember their prayer. We remember their cry. And we listen with ear and heart for the cries of other children so we might respond differently. We quiet our hearts and remember children. The sorrow of being alone in the world, deprived of their relatives, deprived of grandmother's touch, the sound of the drum and the song of the heart, trying to remember what passes into shadow. What was their prayer? What was their silenced song? We remember. remember their prayer. We remember their song. And we listen with ear and heart for the silent songs of other children 
so we might respond differently. We quiet our hearts and remember children, those who never returned to their homes, to their people, the children who disappeared, the children of unmarked forgotten graves, those who had no songs sung for them, no prayers, buried far from their ancestors. What was their mother's prayer? Who waited for them to return home? We remember their prayer. We remember their waiting. And we listen with ear and heart for mother's prayers for other children so we might respond differently. We quiet our hearts and remember children. Children grow up and have children of their own. They've forgotten the language of the people. How can they sing the morning song for their children? How can they teach them the dance long forbidden them? How can they help their children become whole again? Can joy return? We remember their prayers. We remember their loss. And we listen with ear and heart for parents' prayers for other children. So we might respond differently. We quiet our hearts and remember children. History can be painful, a trail of many tears that have stained the cheeks of many children who have been victims of cultural genocide. It is past, but not past. It has happened long ago, but also yesterday. Children are still assaulted and shamed still robbed from their mother's arms. We honor their bravery. We honor their tenacity. We honor their perseverance. We remember their prayer. We remember their bravery. And we listen with ear and heart for their, for their words, words of defiance. And we honor them and the children of today so we might respond differently. Amen. In 
Carlisle's young ones, hearing their voices. A visit to remember those who didn't go home. When the sun is setting and there is only the light of dusk, our spirits speak and walk among us. Not to scare, we stay out of sight. Our voices tell our true stories on into the dawn of a new day's light. In that silence of the evening night, you may still hear our cries of sadness and our cries of fright. When you peer onto the beds we were made to sleep, you may still see the stains on our tear-soaked sheets. Sadness lingers in the dorm's basement air. So thick of sadness does it reek, your body may shake and you may become weak. For you can only imagine the horrors we endured there, but we were forbidden to speak. In little uniforms of gray and white, we were dressed to look just alike. I feel ugly to be dressed alike with my true identity out of sight. 
In traditional clothing, you can see me as part of my tribe, my family, and my community. Marching here and marching there with our feet enduring the shoes of the white man, our little footprints can still be seen upon this Carlisle land. Made to speak and act the same, when I return to my homeland, I think, am I to blame for the shame I feel when I was captured against my will? I struggle to act and feel the Indian in me. I tried hard to keep me, me, the person the creator created me to be. But years of molding lessened the Indian in me. And now I do not even know who is me, the me from my homeland or the me this boarding school made me to be. I never made it back home and here I lie watching the many passersby. They stop and some cry as they read my name upon the headstone frame. But some of my friends didn't even have their name upon their headstone frame. Why? They didn't even know our names? Oh, what shame. Our stories have been hidden for oh so long. But we want you to know that in the graves you stand in front of and see were once little children who just wanted to be alive and free. My spirit. My spirit thanks you for visiting me. Oh. Hello. Um, I'm reading a, a story by Don Bernstick, who was a Cree. Born on the Alexander First Nation, northwest of Edmonton, Alberta, in 1963, Bernstick was deeply affected by the federal government's child separation policies and the literal torture administrated in residential schools. I was very small and too young to go to school, and it was weird because all of the kids were gone from the time they were five until the age of 17. You had to send your kids to these places, whether you wanted to or not. It was the law. The boarding schools were run by the churches to assimilate native kids, teach them English, teach them the Bible, teach them a completely different belief system. It was a really tough scene. My family were Cree speakers. When my brothers returned from boarding school, they no longer spoke Cree. They had long black hair, but now their hair was short. They had been my loving, caring family, but when they came back, it wasn't that way no more. There was a big gap in the community. The parents were in so much pain because their children were taken away. And that's when the drinking started. When the kids came back from the boarding schools, there were a lot of secrets. All of my siblings were brutalized. They were starved. That's what these places were like. When they got home, it led to a lot of ugliness, a lot of drinking, a lot of violence, with everyone inflicting pain on each other. I ended up in foster care. I became a bully with my mouth, acting out, and eventually fell into addiction. I drank so much, I almost froze in the streets. It took a long time to reevaluate my life. I was sitting in a rehab center trying to get to, to the source of what made me drink like that. A lot of it was learned behavior and a lot of it was my pain, the rage I had inside. I had to purge my pain, purge my rage and really explore the other side of who I was. I looked every, everywhere. Jehovah's Witnesses, Baha faith, all that kind of stuff. The last place I looked was my own culture. I connected with my people and learned the way of the pipe and the sweat and the sun dance. Once I engaged in those things, that's when I was able to calm down, get centered and focused. I got over my addictions and learned to heal. Walker says this is why 
Charlie Hill's appearance on the Richard Pryor show in the Tonight Show, uh, Johnny Carson, were so valuable. Charlie could stand up and make us laugh and represent us as people and make us proud. It was meaningful. That's why he was so important for so many of us. I'm reading from the life story of Chippewa actress Katari Walker. Floyd Westerman and Dennis Banks were taken away from their families when they were five years old and sent to the same boarding school. I had also been in a residential school, so they understood me when I talked about it. Most people don't understand what we went through. They took our land, our homes, our children. They put the kids in this genocidal boarding school where they beat the Indianists out of you. My grandfather was raped by one of the priests. When he grew up, he went on to hurt his wife and his kids. It gets passed on. Our elders taught us that our hair is where our memories are stored. So we grew our hair. The first day of boarding school, they cut all of your hair off. They removed your identity and gave you a name like Billy or Sue and told us our grandparents were dead. We were stolen from our families. I was nine years old, holding on to my mother. I didn't want to leave her. I got in trouble from the nuns for holding on to my mother too long. I took a little piece of fur from her coat and I got in trouble for it. The nun said to me, we don't hang on to our mommies here. I thought I would never see her again. They woke me up at 5 a.m. every morning for six weeks. And they made me skin the dead animals that white people had left on the back porch. They figured we would eat anything because we were Indians. At my boarding school, we weren't allowed to have emotions. You couldn't laugh. You couldn't cry. You couldn't whisper. If you did, you were beaten. They used to sprinkle flour on the floor of the school because they said the devil could see up from hell and was trying to steal our souls. I would lie awake all night waiting for the devil to come. We were told we were dirty heathens. Nobody wanted us and nobody would ever love us. When you get raped by a priest or abused by nuns, and then like you get thrown into America where you're treated like a Hollywood stereotype. People expect us to assimilate and lead normal lives, but most of us were traumatized as children. We are a traumatized people. Floyd Westerman, Dennis Banks and Charlie Hill took me in. They understood, they could relate. They were loving, they were supportive, they were so incredibly caring. There was a lot of, a lot of other things, the band. The band was world no, known worldwide. The band, the Carlisle Indian School Band, played at all the football games, played in, um, was, was internationally known. Dennison Wheelock was the first Indian band leader. He was Oneida from Wisconsin. And when he left, his brother took over and they were known for their, uh, for having a wonderful band. It was Philip Sousa type music. And um, they were the first band that crossed the Brooklyn Bridge on opening day. So 
they were they were celebrated and that's one of the more positive stories that comes out it's a difficult narrative most students probably didn't have a wonderful experience but there were people who were who did and and it's worthwhile to remember their contributions oh. i think that's a that's a great story that you know about the ban one of them one of the other great stories there are others but um you know we'll, we'll uh we'll just keep them coming uh -huh. We've just begun to tell the, the stories. Mm -hmm.